Hi, everybody, and happy Will C. Titles Day to everyone who has joined us this evening. I'm Marianne from Three Circles Energy, and I'm joined by Suzanne Lacan Batiste from Nature Seekers, as well as Mr. Kyle Mitchell from Nature Seekers, as well. So, we got together today and we wanted to have this discussion with you all in commemoration of today being the 21st celebration of World Sea Turtle Day. And that was started in commemoration in honor of the work that Dr. Archie Carr had done. He is considered the father of sea turtle biology and conservation in the Western Hemisphere. So this day in remembrance of what used to be his birthday, because uh, he passed in 1987, we remember sea turtle conservation. We remember all the people who have been involved with sea turtle conservation. So um, I'm going to ask Suzanne to introduce herself um, in terms of, yes, yeah, she's from Nature Seekers, what got her into that, and then we'll, and Kyle as well, and then I will talk a little bit about my involvement in sea turtle conservation. And then we'll talk about how it actually got started in Trinidad and Tobago all those decades ago. So Suzanne, uh, uh, congratulations on your latest uh, award, the Greenleaf Award that, that was done, uh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago? So yeah. congratulations and thank you so much for all that you have done for sea turtle conservation here in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much, Marianne. It's a pleasure being on set with you and to celebrate turtles. Turtles yeah. is something that is dear to my heart. At present, I'm the managing director of Nature Seekers. I've been involved in Nature Seekers for over three decades. And it's something I, every night I see turtles, it's like I, I'm now there for the first time. I'm always in awe with them. I'm totally turtle crazy. I'm in love with turtles. I just like their charisma. And I'm so fortunate to be living in a community that has, right in our backyard, so many turtles. Um, for me, being involved, what inspired me, what caused me to be turtle crazy, it's many, many years ago as a young adult being on Matura, when I saw these creatures, how huge they were, how docile, how harmless, um, I really wanted to be a part of that conservation effort that started um, then with the wildlife section by Dr. Carol James, who came and engaged the community. It was something new, something different as a, as a young person, a young woman especially, being involved in conservation. And you know, for most, a night thing is a man's thing. So for me, I wanted to make a difference as a woman as someone who um, wanted to make a change. For me, what echo, what sentiment echo was be the change you want to see in this world. And I wanted to be that change because turtles were being slaughtered, were being killed in large numbers in Matura. When you look back then, it was like a graveyard. So many carcasses, so many things that was happening. You know, I wanted to be a part of this dynamic, um, new, uh, 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 um, era where um, people were actually taking charge, community people taking charge of what was happening in their community. And mm -hmm. I like a good challenge. A lot of people say, Sue, that's a man thing. But I wanted to show that the only limitation is what we set for ourselves. So what drive me was to make that change, to partner making history with government and community for the first time to take care of a national dilemma. So after 32 years, I'm still here, still fascinated, and still driving the good fight of faith. Yeah? Yay for you. And Kyle, let's hear from you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Kyle Mitchell. I am currently the chairman of Nature Seekers. Um, my, my start in conservation uh, stems from, from being allowed as a child uh, to accompany Susan and the team to, to go to the beach and, and see turtles. Um, so the first time I ever saw turtles, I was eight years old. Um, and two years after that, that's when I got my my official start, if you want to call it that, 
uh, in the space of, of turtle conservation. And I have been involved uh, ever since. So now, now, well, back then they used to call me the go for. So <laughs> I have since evolved and, and become something um, great and better because of my involvement in turtle conservation. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your service. And for me, well, I got involved. My I saw my first, my very first uh, nesting leatherback all the way back in 1995. So it's some years um, that back then it was a, I was a member of the UE Biological Society. And we worked with forestry. We worked with nature seekers. We worked with fish and pond uh, to patrol the beaches. And um, that I was able to see um, the first nesting turtle and then after the hatchlings, my first hatchlings experience, that was it. I was hooked. And here I am decades later, still very much passionate about what we can do to improve the situation with our sea turtles. And I've come from the point of view of a volunteer. So I've done the patrols, I've done the guides, um, the guiding. Um, I learned with you all to do the pit tagging, the passive intruder transponder. Uh, tagging, which we started in the, what was it, the late 90s um, with Dr. Eckert. And I'm also coming from the point of view of the artist, the photographer, <laughs> the entrepreneur. Uh, so there's so many ways, so many spin-offs um, that we can take turtle conservation. So mm. in the background there, this is a painting that was done by a local artist, Sasha Emanuel. So big up to Sasha, <laughs> right? And when I saw it, well, of course, I had to have it um, to add to my collection. So these are some of the things that have happened because of sea turtles. Um, there's so much more, and we want to get into that. But before we actually do that, how many of us on the, on the feed knew that, um, well, know the history of sea turtle conservation in Trinidad and Tobago? It actually started back in 19, the early 1960s when turtles used to be slaughtered um, and then they would be allowed to wash out the shore and the leatherbacks would be used as target practice for mariners uh, shooting. And then um, Mr. Ian Lambie, and we thank you for your service to this country, sir, if you are watching. Um, that was back in 1963 and then by 1965, he engaged the Field Naturalist Club, and they were the ones to actually start beach monitoring and collecting data. And then from the, the 60s, we progressed now because by then as well, coming down to the later part of the 1960s, the Natural History Society was uh, started by Professor Julian Duncan. Um, and then in the 70s, we went on to the work of Professor Peter B Bacon, who did some research on the sea turtles here in Trinidad. Um, we had input from the Point of Pair Wildfowl Trust as well. Molly Gaskin was also involved. Again, everything in partnership with the wildlife section. And then 1987, this is where UE Biological Society, uh, um, having grown from the Natural History Society, started the patrols and then started partnering with nature seekers um, and the Fish and Pond group to, and uh, the other members of forestry as well to continue the patrols and to continue spreading that message of we need to care for our resources. So fast forward now, here we are in 2021 and the number of slaughters, uh, at least on the beaches, have decreased to what it used to be back in the 1960s. So guys, do you want to fill us in in terms of what the journey has been like for nature seekers coming from starting, formally starting in 1990 and what led to that and what are some of the initiatives that you all have been in involved in in terms of promoting sea turtle conservation, not only to Trinidad and Tobago, but the region and the world at large? Well, I will start off saying that... Um... Uh, in 1990, the government called, it was a national concern. Um, turtles were being killed in large numbers. Our beach, as I said previously, was like a graveyard. There were so many carcasses everywhere. And the community itself in, where, in which I live and neighboring communities, we were part of the problem. 
we had poaching poachers that live and came from Matura. Um, the government actually came, and as I said, we created history by having this partnership formed with the forestry division, mainly the wildlife section, to engage the community. And that worked very well in terms of um, the government reaching out, having discussion, stakeholder meeting. I remember when it started, we actually had, we thought that the government was coming to curtail our activities. We would no longer have um, access to our beaches, especially in the early 90s when they talk about making the beach prohibited, mm -hmm. which means for us at the community, it means stipulation. It means that we weren't going to have our backyard recreation anymore. So we had, we came out in, in vigor and, and to really put up a fight with the government. But the head of the section then, who had the vision to include and were very instrumental and very good in having um, that communication ability to talk to the community and said it's not about um, curtailing the activities, it's not about restricting you all, but partnering to create a, a avenue for all generations to see this resource that is so much a treasure in our country. So we had um, that taking place and with the training we got, that collaborative effort, Matura then had a group of people that was trained and was ready to actually go out and do a lot of patrol. So we had the opportunity as a community to partner with government and to take care of a national dilemma. We now, tell, start, yeah? mm -hmm. tell me something. So how did you all prepare for those, um, those uh, patrols? Because back in those times, the poachers would come with their equipment. So how... How, what was it like as a patroller back in those days? What sort of things did you all have, did we have for defending ourselves on the beach? One thing we learned was to kiss, keep it short and sweet, and disarm with charm. So <laughs> we learned that, and we actually got into physical fights and so on. We, it was really tough. And mm -hmm. it took long, prolonged hours of volunteerism because I must say that when Nature Seekers started, we started with zero no monies at all the only thing is it that happened is the the head of the section said if you use this resource wisely then a whole stream of ecotourism activities could come out and then the community can use this resource as a tool for conservation while promoting sustainability and we believe that and we work towards that and um when we started we got into fight the poachers didn't stop we would remain all night on the beach until the last turtle would have gone and there was none for the, the, the poachers to kill because we were there, our presence created quite an awareness. So we were there every night. Everybody thought we were crazy. We were called turtle police, mother of turtle and the whole host of things because it was a big paradigm shift from being a free for all access. Everyone could have gone ride a turtle, hack out a few turtles, um, found a turtle meat, um, take out two flippers, then our presence created, you know, we will see how long they will stay and they will get fed up eventually and leave, but that didn't happen. Perseverance bring a lot of success. We continue and um, we continue the, the good fight and today Matura is like an active maternity ward. We don't have any poaching on our beach because of our presence. Great. That's great. And Kyle? You want to add anything in terms of your experience joining a team? I, I I would just say that I am quite grateful that I didn't have to to face some of the challenges that that the team had to face back then. Uh, when I started, everything was pretty uh, cool and simmered down by then. Uh, so it was a fairly easy running when when I joined the the team. Yeah. Well, for me. Um, Luckily, I did not have as many of those situations to deal with, but we still had some. And what we found was that the because of the numbers that were on the beach, because we, you know, we were safety in numbers then basically, and you know, potential 
uh, poachers would come, they'd realize, oh, wait, y'all are here like every Friday, every weekend or every, you know, after semester was over, we'd, we'd come more often and they realize, oh, okay, all right, so let's cancel activities for this night. But I mean, yes, it did, you know, for those of us who have that passion to protect the natural environment, it, it did, you know, raise some, <laughs> it was a challenge at times to actually you know, not go after them and, and you know, try to, to rationalize with them in terms of, please stop doing this. Why are you doing this? You know, this is for our future and, you know, all those things. And as you get older, you learn probably more uh, di diplomatic ways, as you mentioned, Suzanne, in terms of how do we deal with these things and how do we engage people um, and help them to understand our cause. You know, I've had conversations with fishermen <laughs> and, you know, they, they try to justify why they use the shells of the hawksbills to, to make jewelry still and, you know, you title conservation people. Because, of course, yes, we have the labels, right? And I wear them all with great pride and honor for my country and for the world in extension, you know. And it's about sharing that information with them, trying to understand their perspective um, and see, you know, how we could meet in the middle somewhere, you know, in terms of a win-win situation there. So um, that's what we, that's what we're trying to do, and that's what we continue to do. And you know, the pandemic now has brought some challenges to us in terms of our turtle conservation efforts. So, would y'all like to share some of the the challenges that uh, we've encountered over the last two years? Definitely. Um, in terms of us going out to. Uh, the first year was really tough in that um, there was a, we just had the opportunity to retrieve some of our satellite device. And Kyle will talk about that a little bit more because of um, his involvement in the placing of the stat tags on our turtles in collaboration with um, Canada and Trinidad and Tobago. However, we, because of the, 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 tags returning, we got permission just to access um, some of the beaches on the North Coast, Grand mm -hmm. River and Matura to retrieve the tags. So mm -hmm. our presence was very limited in terms of going out and actually collecting data. This year, however, we got, um, after lobbying and talking, sending lots of letters to our Prime Minister, the Minister of Health, we were so fortunate to actually got the Minister of Health um, to come up and um, see what we were doing after we invited him to see the length of our beach and um, how important our data collection is to the whole um, population numbering in our country. Mm -hmm. So he came up um, and was very much active and see what is happening. And we were able to get the exemption and mm -hmm. our few pass and everything to go out and to do our total tagging because um, for us at Nature Seekers, it is very critical for data. It is very important. So we are able, we are working along with the police. They are very supportive. Um, we have um, all the support in terms of being on the beach and doing what we do best. So mm -hmm. I will let Kyle talk ab about the, the start tag and what we did this year as well as we got um, um, permission and what we did last year. So Kyle... Yeah, um, so as Susan mentioned uh, last year, 2020, uh, it was quite challenging in terms of data collection uh, in the country, mainly because of, as everyone knows, uh, the pandemic. Uh, so last year we had challenges being able to go out as a full unit um, to monitor or manage our, our nesting beaches. However, we did get some, some concessions in terms of access to the beach um, in limited numbers that we were able to retrieve a couple satellite transmitters that we deployed in collaboration with uh, fisheries and oceans in Canada. So a lot of the work that Nature Seekers um, would do as a body, we do in collaboration with many other entities and organizations locally and over the pond. Um, so they would have deployed a couple satellite transmitters uh, in the summer before, and some of those turtles actually uh, came to Trinidad to nest. 
Um, so it was quite an adventure because we had one that was nesting in Matura and then we had another that was nesting in Las Cuevas. Um, so we had to be moving back and forth between Matura and Las Cuevas trying to intercept these turtles uh, in order to replace their units because after some time, uh, either the battery life on the units go dead or mm -hmm. because they are mating when they are within our waters as well, uh, sometimes the males would knock the tags off. So we always trying to intercept those turtles before we lose transmissions uh, from them and we are able to swap the tags out for new units. Right. So where else, so in terms of the tagging now, tell us some more in terms of uh, what the tagging program has been able to help us learn about sea turtles. So we have um, a couple different tagging initiatives. Um, the main one that persons would be used to or accustomed with uh, is that of the flipper tags and the pit tag that you mentioned. So the yeah. flipper tags, those are metal clips, one on each rear flipper. Uh, mm -hmm. Those tags have a five digit number and T at the beginning, which stands for Trinidad. So that's our tag series for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have the microchip that's a little bigger than a rice grain and that's inserted into the left or right shoulder of the turtle and that's gonna last the entire life of the turtle. Whereas the flipper tags would only last about three to five years then fall off. Uh, so that's the, the tagging that most persons would be used to. But as technology improves, um, we also venture into other areas of uh, tagging and data collection that mm -hmm. allow us to better understand uh, turtles in general. So we use uh, satellite tags where we are able to monitor the movement of the turtles when they are nesting within our waters so we can tell for instance, um, letterbacks, when they are finished nesting or um, laying one clutch of eggs, they would generally venture about two and a half to three kilometers um, offshore just off the nesting beaches. Um, so we are able to see things like this because of satellite tagging. And we also started doing VHF tagging uh, that allow us to understand beach fidelity um, of the species as well. Right. Now we have a couple of questions in the audience. I'm going to put it up there. So Renee is asking, um, do you have a rough idea of the numbers of people you have been able to impact via tours annually? So either yeah. of you. Yeah, definitely. What we do as well, apart from the data that is collected on turtles, we have data that is collected on visitors as well. Mm -hmm. It is so um, much quantified that we have adults, children, foreign adults, foreign um, students, foreign children. And we have annually about 15,000 visitors on Matura Beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that, that is Matura alone. So um, just, just put it in here that um, unfortunately representatives from SOS Tobago, from Grand River Nature, Tour Guide Association, as well as Las Cuevas um, Eco Association could not make today's session, but they are also working along with nature speakers in terms of collecting that information and, you know, so where we can get a full picture, a holistic picture of turtle conservation, well, turtle populations in Trinidad and Tobago. So we have another question here from Ms. Mitchell. So this one, probably a tough question to answer. Was 2021 a better year for successful turtle nesting? <laughs> that's that's a good question, um, and it's 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 a question that ha can can produce multiple responses as well. Uh, in terms of was it better? Yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that we were able to be out. Uh, we were undisturbed by visitors being present on the beach, but at the same time, the amount of sargassum being on the beach, uh, it also hinders uh, successful nesting. And in the case of visitors, when we do have visitors on the beach, they would actually help us clear sargassum 
in order to facilitate uh, a successful nesting. Uh, so it's kind of a double-edged sword when it comes to 2021 being a, a good year for nesting. Right. And then now that brings us to another question now in terms of are we still close to volunteers right now? Definitely. Because of the... Um, State of Yes, state of emergency and the COVID restriction and so on, we definitely cannot facilitate volunteerism on Matura. But when I look at the beach on a nightly basis, how I miss our volunteers. I want to tell mm -hmm. the volunteers how much they have contributed to successful nesting. Mm -hmm. Prior to the, the, the COVID, um, restrictions and the, the no one is allowed on the beach. The volunteers, especially the corporate bodies, the schools, and all those who came out and support. Only now, um, you we actually see the huge impact of no volunteers coming to actually make Matura Beach safe for turtle nesting, safe mm -hmm. from debris and successful nesting. Mm -hmm. I I totally miss them. Um, I totally miss having um, that volunteerism, it, bec it, it has become a, a part of Nature Seekers and having the beach um, well prepared for these activities. So volunteerism is something that I long for every day, even up to last night with the amount of um, sagasum that is on the beach and how difficult the garrisons that are made with the sagasum seaweed on the beach, only the, the, the volunteers can move it can help us do that. So yeah. we have definitely, and apart from that, um, we still have a number of people as well coming in and having volunteers at night on our tag tours to tag all these turtles. We at Nature Seekers, the thing that we lack is um, um, volunteers, human human um, capacity on our beach to help us. And, and the training people love to do it. We believe in conservation through experience. When you come and you have that experience of tagging the turtle, working with the animal, it changes perception. It brings you closer to the animal. You understand how privileged we are in Trinidad and Tobago to have yes. these awesome, spectacular, prehistoric animal on our beaches. So this conservation through experience um, opportunity that we offer our volunteers our, our um, tour visitors and so on is something that is remarkable. As I said, I am there three decades and I'm still awe at night with how these animals come in and sculpt their nests and do their ritual. So for having the, the, the opportunity to educate our tour personals and having our um, personnel to help us patrol Matura is something that we welcome on our beach. Our beach is 8.8 .8 kilometers long. And when you have turtles in every nook and cranny on a peak night, we cannot humanly tag all these turtles to count our population or to number them. And it's sad when so many of them go back without being tagged. So volunteerism is something that is so critical and important to turtle conservation on our beaches. And from, from the Three Circles Energy point of view, for those who have joined in this chat and are not aware, we curate uh, sustainable immersive travel experiences. So this year we had planned a couple of experiences with yes. nature. Um, again, this is, you know, our focus is on helping people to network, helping people to connect with nature, to connect with others, to connect with themselves and thereby becoming the best version of themselves possible. So in our experiences, what we do is plan for people to give back. Yes, you are learning, but it's a continuous loop. It's energy. So that's why we the package that we had planned with Nature Seekers was going to involve some of that tagging in addition to learning more about the biology of the turtle and how we could get involved. So there are questions coming up in terms of, I want to volunteer. How do I get involved? So we do have a volunteer program uh, that local persons can apply for. Um, mm -hmm. It's a simple process of sending us an email expressing your interest and mm -hmm. we would forward all the uh, necessary documents uh, to you explaining how the program runs, how the program is managed, um, some criteria to be met and then you are fully part of the team. 
Great. So yeah, so I'm just trying to keep up with the <laughs> the comments here as well. And this, of course, on, extends not only to nature seekers, guys. It also a volunteerism. Sorry, volunteer work is also um, available in Grand River in for SOS Tobago, and also opportunities exist with Las Cuevas as well. So there are many opportunities to get involved. So um, there's a comment here in terms of seeing lots of nesting activity on Grafton Beach this this season. And how can we get restaurants and hotels along the beach to cooperate with dimming or, sh or um, shading lights, putting on the red lights uh, pointed towards the sea? We have seen good success with stakeholder management in Grand River. Yes, this is true. Jonathan, thank you for that comment. Um, so, guys, any any um, anything you want to add there in terms of um, how do we get people involved? That's, that's a really good um, question and comment um, because I know part of the part of the reason Grand River is successful with mm -hmm. engaging uh, the restaurants and the hotels um, is showing them the benefit or the value that having these turtle friendly type lights and, and resources um, adds to the experience of their customers. So by mm -hmm. selling the point of, of building and enhancing that experience for customers, I think uh, there is potential for buying from those uh, uh, restaurants and hotels. And this is where I also want to add as well, as, as a, a citizen, as a visitor, as someone who is curious, as somebody who cares about the turtles, we ultimately, the power of choice lies with us. So if it is, for example, you have situations where you engage hotel via various associations, you've written to them, um, you know, they go and they build their bar right over Grafton Beach, for example, and you continue talking to them, there's no, um, you're not seeing any avail. Because of your values, you are free to choose other places that are more in line with your values. So you are free to and to continue encouraging to, and uh, continue uh, sharing that message, and um, yeah, the power is yours. So if you if you continue to, um, for me, a personal peeve is the activities that go on on Turtle Beach in Tobago, and we're talking high, you know, high energy activities. We had um, one of those foreign uh, people coming down to do uh, sports on during nesting season, and when you do that, it, it it negates the efforts that we are trying to do in terms of protecting the nest, right? Um, so again, the choice is yours. You can raise your voice peacefully, or you can write letters to your um, members of parliament, um, your Ministry of Planning and Development, Agriculture, go through all the means necessary in peace, and then you can take take the final the final choice. No, I'm not supporting this event. Um, for those, you know, who are into the fets and stuff and they have no problem going to, to jump up and down on Turtle Beach during nesting season, again, the choice is yours. Um, we can only guide the process, right? Um, yeah, so <laughs> I just wanted to just put that that part of it in because it, it um, it's a bit disturbing um, being in this for almost three decades and you still have that kind of attitude when when you when you interact with people on the international scale there are people who are willing to fly to trinidad and tobago to volunteer with the, and help see it i've i had clients who i had to because of the, the flying situation we had to postpone it so hopefully next year they will come but you know when you see a growing attitude towards care and concern for nature it encourages us. This is our resource. We are blessed to actually have this resource, and it is our responsibility to take care of it in the best way possible. That's definitely correct. And and as you mentioned, there are people who would travel the world uh, just mm -hmm. to see a leatherback turtle. There are places, there are other places in the world that leatherbacks nest on. Uh, Trinidad yeah. is not the only place. However, Trinidad is one of the places that you are almost guaranteed to see a leatherback turtle nesting. That's that's how special we are here. 
there's that and then then of course in addition to the Ladabak, you have we have the highest biodiversity in the eastern caribbean right so they come those who are interested in in animals and plants in general they will come to trinidad this is and this is some i um, want to talk about the the industry as a whole and if we want to term it eco tourism if we want to brand it as that when it comes to turtles and the interests of turtles around the world, right? It is a multi-million dollar industry in Trinidad and Tobago. So when you look at the tours, when you look at the uh, accommodations, when you look at the people who provide meals, when you look at the people who provide transport, when you look at the artists, when you look at creators like these can you see hopefully you all can see these suzanne uh, yeah right yeah these are some of the, these these spin-offs from um from turtles just turtles alone the t-shirts um the shawls the towels the stickers on cars right and we can go on and jewelry we can go on and on and on and it is a multi-million dollar industry and this is something that we have to, you know, I think is important that we continue to work together to share that message. Tourism is not, tourism, Trinidad and Tobago is not only about one thing only. It's many different things. Turtles are one aspect of it. Turtles are March to August generally, right? And then of course, peak season being mid-May to mid-June. And there's so much more. So do you want to share with us what else does nature seekers involved in in terms of environmental work so when turtles are no longer coming and the all the hatchlings have been um accounted well uh, accounted for as best as possible what else does nature seekers do during the months of say september october november december january um just one thing on turtle conservation as well what we do also is we have something we call the morning count where we would walk <laughs> our entire 8.8 kilometer of beach and gps all our nesting activities and check our high tide and this is done every day mm -hmm. of the total season so what we miss in the night it can we still have data to show um the, our population how many turtles are nesting um on our beaches as well mm -hmm. apart from that we have so many activities as nature seekers because conservation of itself is highly expensive it's yes. um, turtle conservation. It's a nice thing. It takes a lot from the individual who is involved in this conservation activity. And it's seasonal. So you find we had many struggles in terms of keeping our resource trained persons. They would mm -hmm. eventually be drafted into other employment scheme because of the seasonality. However, mm -hmm. we have been innovative and created a, a lot of opportunity outside of the turtle season. Opportunity. Yes where we had a lot of state agency partner with us. We had the Ministry of Tourism doing a whole pro program with us where we offer kayaking, um, mm -hmm. going up in this pristine river. And it's something where you rejuvenate with our kayaks. Our guys are trained. We did a lot of um, yeah. training and safety, um, CPR, a whole host of things that ensure visitor safety. We also have... Um, where you go up, you kayak, you, you can swim in our pool, you feel rejuvenated, as I said. It's for those who love um, that environment. It's unpolluted. It's uninhabited. It's being out there. And when you bathe in that water, you feel like you knock off a few years. You feel young and rejuvenated again. So we <laughs> offer that tour where you go up and we interpret all the flora and fauna that exists within that area. We also have where we do all the waterfalls and river in our area, the mermaid mm -hmm. pool, the Rio Seco, you walk mm -hmm. through our forest. We have a lot of forest tours that we do where we talk about our tree species. You learn about dendrology, our waterways, mm -hmm. our water system, seeing some mm -hmm. of the flora and fauna that exists within our area. Then we have the whole community experience where you will eat our local food, in our community, you get all of Matura best in, in it. You get to stay in our community, learn about our culture, our way of life. Um, you get that whole package of, of being in Matura, being exposed to the Matura people. And 
Then we have all our local shops and, and our small business that has resulted of that spin around the turtle. When someone come into Matura, they can overnight and they do all the other activities. So we have engaged the taxi drivers, the local girls, the, um, ta um, the, the shop owners. They welcome the turtle season. They welcome visitors in our community. So it's not just dependent on, um, on, on, on government um, jobs and so on, which is very limited. But we yeah. have learned in our community how to actually capitalize. Then we have our trash into cash program where mm -hmm. our single mothers and unemployed women are now sculpting um, these discarded glass bottles that is unappealing in our environment. We collect them and we have learned how to make a lot of jewelry that is branded Turtle Warriors, because it comes from our Turtle Beach. It comes from a whole obstruction of turtle not being able to access the beach or lay because of all these bottles that come down our estuaries and form part of the, um, the, 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 the unappealing site in that environment. So it's now being taken off the beach and our women, and, uh, and uh, especially our single mothers and unemployed women, are sculpting these um, bottles, melting them using oxygen and propane gas and making bees that we brand Turtle Warrior. So when you purchase one of these items, you support conservation. You support our, our, our craft industry, our single mothers and unemployed women, and it goes back into our conservation effort. So one can come and actually sculpt their own piece. We have all equipment, which was made possible through BPTT, B BHP. They purchase all the equipment for us, so you can come and learn how to use oxygen and propane gas that melt your bottle and form your own pieces. So we are repurposing, reducing, recycling, and turning our trash into cash at Matura. And that is what responsible, that is a great example of responsible tourism is where, you know, again, th that importance of working together and everybody benefits from the interaction. Everybody learns because I'm sure um, I, I continue to have opportunities to learn with you all. You will learn from me as well when my clients can, can come. And, you know, when we go into the forest, um, looking even um when you look at things like for example manatees in the river how many experiences have you had with manatees swimming up that river as well it is it is a, a viable place for them to be you know so again they not only get we see turtles and that's it right you you see you can see a whole bunch of different things if you want to look at the geology of that part of the of the island in terms Definitely. of our it's amazing stuff, amazing stuff. You can easily spend a few days and not want to leave <laughs> Matura, for sure. I, I, I could vouch for that. I could vouch for that. So we have a, a comment. Um, well, you know, people are talking about the great work in terms of the cottage industries. And yeah, you see in glass jewelry, again, we're using our trash. So that then impacts another part. Um, this is how we are implementing the sustainable development goals. So, you know, people think, oh, yeah, that's just for scientists and government people to talk about. But th these no, are no. Real life examples of how people like us can help to implement the sustainable development goals. So when we talk total conservation, generally it tends to fall in sustainable development goal number 14, which deals with protection of the sea. And here it is now we have waste man waste reduction because we're using the glass. So again, it impacts another sustainable development goal. And we keep going on. And you know, so that's that's great. Then there's a comment. Um wait, are you oh whoops? So we get we're being asked, do we publish these stories? So you want to take it or you want me to, to take it, Suzanne or Kyle? We, we have not started um, publishing. What we do is like in our workshop and seminars, we will talk about um, all that Nature Seekers has been doing and some of our stories and so on. But definitely we are thinking about publishing our success story, um, talking about... Um, letting others know what we have done because what we did and what we have been doing is 
teaching other communities how they too can have their own efforts within their community. At Nature Seekers, one of our goals is not to have um, us being spread out throughout the country, but empowering other community groups and teaching them and, and being side by side with them in terms of all that we have learned that they too can improve their community and as a result, the country will be better. So we have been sharing our stories, uh, sharing our training, all that we know within Nature Seekers to other community groups. So definitely we would want to document this and write up some of our success stories so that it will be able to help other countries. And Nature Seekers has taken our Trash in the Cast program all of the islands. We have taught um, Myro Islands, um, Antigua, their turtle nests on their beaches, definitely how they too can remove this trash and create sub-employment for, for women, for men, artisans as well. Yes, great, great stuff. So Kyle, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, the beach cleanup this year? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, maybe Kyle. All right, so I guess uh, well we could talk about it uh, what, until he comes back. Um, so in terms of the beach cleanup, so every year before the official start of the turtle nesting season, um, Nature Seekers organizes an annual, well, what has become an annual beach cleanup yeah. uh, in an effort to clear the beach of the big pieces of trash that can cause damage to turtles or hinder them as they make their way up the, um, the beach to find the perfect spot for their nest. So Suzanne, can you tell us a little bit about um, how maybe how much garbage was collected this year and what was different about this year's beach cleanup as opposed to years gone by? This year, um, we because of the COVID restriction, we again wrote to CMOH in our region and we did got permission. However, the large crowd that we would have on one Sunday where last year we, we normally, we started very small and having a few persons to so going over 20 something hundred persons coming it has become very big remember i mm -hmm. said previously that our efforts is really supported by volunteer and that is so much one of the resources that nature seekers yes. has become dependent on and has become a, a, a real backbone for organization mm -hmm. this year however we got permission but we had to do it over two week or eight days period where we would have would have had to have smaller groups coming but yeah. we were very fortunate to have it and um we started and we had the groups coming in and we yeah. really got a lot of areas covered for the turtles to nest successfully the beach um we removed more than 500 um bags of garbage and there was so much debris that was removed um from off the beach as well and i must say this was I don't know if it was COVID with the help of um, the, every place of being clean. Um, I have never seen so many areas clean in Trinidad and Tobago, the washrooms and so on. It, it's to me, it's a pleasantry that I enjoy. Um, <laughs> and the garbage was collected on time. It was off the beach. Sometimes we would remain weak, but the corporation yeah. really took it off on time and the beach was really remain intact. So this year, the beach cleanup, we got a lot of support from the, the, the different organizations, EMA and forestry and so on. It was mm -hmm. remarkable. We had a lot of the um, different groups came on and um, we didn't have the display as we normally would have had. But yeah. even last year, prior to COVID, we had a big beach cleanup and we had all of the different organizations will come out and support. It has become something that is a calendar event for many organizations, schools, institutions, corporate bodies, and so on. And um, I'm proud to say that the country is more and more sensitized because of what um, Nature Seekers have been doing and all the other um, conservation okay. group in Trinidad and Tobago showing the yeah. importance of this magnificent resource that we have in Trinidad. So a lot of corporate people are already becoming more and more engaged, involved, not just mm -hmm. financially, but with their personal support, their, their employees, their students, the schools, the universities, um, organization, everyone would come in and actually 
help us remove the, the, the garbage from off the beach to make it safe for turtles to nest successfully and for visitors to view in safety. And um, it's a, a, a task that we at Nature Seekers cannot possibly do it alone. So this year was a year, it broke up in smaller group and the yeah. beach was really clean and ready for the turtles. And we enjoy a couple months really from that. However, with climate impact, we have had a lot of sagasum. And again, yeah. previously we would have the corporate bodies will come and clean up the area and the turtles were able to nest. Um, we don't have that opportunity because of health restrictions and we understand. However, um, the debris were collected, the garbage was removed, and then we had the, the, the intervention of COVID restriction again. So that's where we are in terms of the beach cleanup. But what we did during the last year is we will have um, smaller beach cleanup because our beach is a very active, high energy beach on Matura. Everything ends up on the shore. And we would have sub beach cleanup from corporate bodies. And this is something that is very much in dire need. And I really want COVID to go away. So do I, so do I, so I can actually come back mm -hmm. <laughs> and stay. So we have another uh, question here um, in terms of the internships. So can you, can you talk about before COVID, the internships, how it functioned in Nature Seekers? Because it has been a mm -hmm. reactive program. What we, what we encourage is because of the training, um, mm -hmm. we at Nature Seekers believe that having interns and having conservation through experience help students to determine their career choices mm -hmm. in that they are able to work with the animals um they are out there with all the elements all the factors that will help shape them and determine hey look i can do this or this is really not for me you know mm -hmm. and so on so we encourage them to come out what we do as well because it's uh, a lot of training we would expect them to be out there for a certain period of time not just to come one night and leave because or two nights we would not mm -hmm. be able to capitalize on that resource the energy and the time we will take in training them and getting yeah. them on board in doing tagging um nest excavation um doing right. hatchling survival rate doing um temperature testing even right. the weighing of the turtles we do a lot of different activities on our beach and to right. maximize the use of students and give them a true experience, it must be done over a number of days and time. Yeah? yeah. So internship is very important. We believe it helps to shape our country to have a lot of biologists, people who are crazy about the environment, to have that um, moment where a lot of decision and, and um, attitudinal change, career um, building will be experienced and um, a lot of opinions and, and, and trust will be given as we have them on the beach with us. Yeah. And what, so what is the, so for someone who is interested from a foreign university who may want to come and, and do volunteer work or do conservation studies with you all, uh, can you tell us what is the normal procedure for getting getting that going? Of course, post-COVID because, you know, we yes moving that away. That, that is one of the stronghold of nature seekers. We have been doing that for many years. We yes. have had a lot of students, Principia University, Duke University, mm -hmm. um, CISA Board. We had a number of university. Even for COVID 2020, we were all ready and ready to run with about five university registered to come and do a lot of their studies with us, especially the mm -hmm. upper, upper um, students who are doing their PhD or, or on board and in, in leaving the university. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that it helped in generating income. It's a part of um, um, a tourism that has captured a niche in that they are paid student. They will pay for accommodation, not the um, elaborate amount and so on for accommodation and meals and transportation back and forth and, and going out every night and, and tagging the animals and so on. So it's like a, a paid um, internship that they will, the university will have their arrangement with us and we have at least within six to 12 students or even more will come in and work every night within a certain hour where we can actually have them for the first few days introduce yeah. them because many have never seen the animal before so they will have that um introduction too 
and then yeah. we go into training where they will have a day of seeing the beach acclimatizing themselves with the area the zones our beach is zoned off they will mm -hmm. we'll go through the data so all the equipment because some as i said i've never seen turtles before and then we'll take them out the first night and then start the training where they will learn how to approach the animal when to put on lights how to what type of lights to use how to measure the animals how to put in the pet tags and the flipper tags and everything about the animal and that will take about most of our internship program lasts for two weeks within 10 to 11 to 12 days and then in that as well we will have them visiting other parts of Trinidad and Tobago within having tours scheduled for them so they'll have a holistic um experience of what Trinidad offers right good Kyle so we see you back on that's so happy <laughs> yeah apologies uh the network dropped by <laughs> it happens it happens thank god I mean you know we we we, we've had most of it. So we have a, a we were talking there about um, the interaction with students from foreign universities coming over to do internships. And um, we also have a comment from Ms. Dasant in terms of the contribution that the late uh, Sylvia Casal as well made in terms of um, turtle conservation back in the 90s. So yeah, um, you know, we respectfully extend our thanks to Sylvia for the work that she has done as well um, when she was uh, with us. So there are so many people who have been involved in, in uh, sea turtle conservation here in Trinidad and Tobago. And, you know, it's about everybody, um, again, continuing to work together. So we spoke about in terms of if you want to get involved um, as a volunteer and what the steps are to take. Now, for those of us who when the beaches reopen, um, hopefully by the end of the state of emergency at the end of August, and we return to the beaches. Um, we saw a couple of days ago from some videos that were released by UDICOT, the um, discovery of hatchlings emerging from their nest in Maracas. And for many people, they are excited. They are like, my God, I didn't know that we had turtles uh, nesting in, on those beaches. And what can we then help them to understand if it is that they go to a beach and they come upon emerging hatchlings or a female that has come ashore to nest? What are some of the things that we need to be aware of? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so in terms of um, emerging hatchlings, it's always advised to allow those hatchlings to walk or to crawl from uh, land to water. Uh, yes. That process of moving from land or that transition of moving from land to water is referred to as imprinting. Um, most persons I'm sure would have heard uh, that turtles return to the beach of birth and they are able to do that because of that imprinting process. Um, once we tamper with that imprinting process, the belief is if it's a female turtle, she would not um, recognize or she would not know what to do if she does survive to be an adult. Um, so it's always recommended to allow them to crawl from uh, land to water by themselves. All you do is ensure that there aren't any uh, predators around that could take them. And by predators, um, we are talking here about the magnificent frigate birds, the stray dogs that may be about. Um, what happens is, so for example, if you happen to come upon the hatchlings during the day, of course, um, a permit is required to handle any protected endangered animal in this country. So one of the first things you want to do is to try to call the forestry, the wildlife section or the EMA or nature seekers or any one of the other groups. So for example, if you're in Tobago, you call SOS and let them know what is going on, where you are, which beach you are on, um, where on the beach you are. If you have GPS coordinates, that's great. Um, the time, the conditions, so whether it's cloudy um, or, or very sunny, it's raining. Um, you look at the, the turtle that is coming up to the net, um, for their condition in terms of any visible marks of damage, 
you look for the tags um and again kyle you want to take us through that process a little bit more in terms of do we just go up to the table and fight out to get the tag number or how do we do that yeah so the first the first thing you want to do is you want to avoid approaching the turtle directly from the front or the line of sight uh you want right. to allow the turtle some time to see what she wants to do first is she, does she look like she's actually going to the nest is she still looking for the temperature um is the turtle injured so you want to first um observe and see what's taking place with the turtle if she is actually attempting to nest you want to allow her some time to settle in and then you approach from the back uh you approach the turtle from the back and you look closely to see if she has any tags if you notice mm -hmm. any metal clips hanging from the rear flippers those are tags yeah. so you want to again give her some time to settle in perhaps she starts to dig you want to see if she starts laying once she starts laying you can then uh, read the, the digits or the information off of those tags so most that's, tags that's, if not all of them will uh -huh. If you can emphasize that again, when she starts laying. So not when she's making the nest, right? <laughs> and the reason for that is, is why? Yeah, so uh, you want to ensure that the turtle has the highest chance or possibility of successfully nesting. Uh, mm -hmm. so sometimes persons are so curious and excited to see the turtle. Uh, you know, they want to gather the data to share it with us and stuff. Um, yes. that they approach the turtle from behind, but they cave the nest in. And if you cave the nest, then most times the turtles abandon and they would leave. Um, but you want to ensure that the turtle successfully nests, so you want to give her some time to, to actually settle in and start depositing the eggs. All right, good. So another thing as well, um, in terms of the hatchlings now, um, we try as much as possible, if you come upon them, to release them at the, after dusk, after it gets dark. Again, as Kyle mentioned, it is to deal to minimize the possibility of predators swooping down in the water after they take that first swim and then they become food for them. So again, you know, these are little things that, that we can use to help. Um, also too, we recommend wearing of the gloves. And the reason for that is that the chemicals on our hands may cause um them because remember they're babies they then now emerging from their nest just like a regular human baby where you have to protect them at all costs um we can actually run the risk of of, of giving passing on a fungus to them which uh which then makes life very difficult for them and then leads to to death in most cases not not so well what we advise because a lot of people smoke there's nicotine on the hand you know there's different chemicals on your hand you try as much as possible if you have to handle them because you might be on a beach where you do you are not expecting a emerging of a nest of hatchlings so you would want to ensure as much as possible that they they reach into the ocean safely because as Kai said if you if you try and keep them um until dark remember it, it interferes with their imprinting to be able to crawl down on the beach and access so you ensure that the area is clear normally what we do um we would go in early afternoon because as soon as the sun set it get cool that's when hatchlings start emerging they start coming out if the the weather is overcast they will emerge from the nest because the temperature keep them inactive they, they they're immobile so once it's cool it's overcast it's it's, it's a rainy day, the hatchlings will emerge. They will hatch. Yeah. So what you need to do is ensure that the, if it's sagasum, you get them all because sagasum is one of their main hindrance. They will get caught up in it and then the ghost crab, the frigate birds, the, even the vultures, they are favorite food for the vultures. People will not believe that, but the vultures consume huge amount of leatherback hatchlings. Mm -hmm. we, we will shoot them away and ensure that the hatchling enter into the water so that they can have their first set of imprinting to take their journey. So you try as much as possible not to handle the hatchlings too much, not to play with them or, or, or cause any disturbance in terms of the probability of having that hatchling successfully 
come back as an adult. And if you learn about the statistics, out of every thousand babies, one may reach maturity. Survival rate is very, very low for our baby turtles in yeah. that they have so many natural predators. So as much and as many as possible that can go out into the ocean, the probability of having adults come back is something that we need to do. Leatherbacks cannot be rare in captivity. It's very difficult. It's highly expensive. I just wanted to add, so in Grand River, for those who are familiar with, with Grand River, they also are doing a hatchery system there, um, a husbandry, sorry, system there, where they have a number of green and hawksbill turtles that yeah. are maintained in seawater tanks and fed um, so up to a certain size, and then they are released. And it's believed this project was funded by Atlantic several years ago. And yeah. it is believed that if we give them a chance to grow to a juvenile phase, it will increase their chances of survival. So that is something else that, that is available to look at um, with regards to sea turtle conservation in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Now, that, um, it's over an hour <laughs> that we've been talking. And um, there are still a couple of comments here that I just wanted to um, just reach out and, and let you all uh, see them. So Rehana is asking about doing uh, training videos or preparation videos for scenarios. And um, um, we we could actually uh, and yeah, it's something we could do. It may not be videos at the moment, um, but we yeah. do have photographs of uh, the tagging process and how it's done that uh, we can share. Uh, with the wider public on how you handle and approach turtles and so forth. And Jonathan, um, wait a minute. Jonathan is asking, um, what time do the hatchlings normally emerge? In the afternoon, we normally yeah. would go out uh, for so, both. So, so yeah. as Go ahead. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah. Kyle, you go ahead. Yeah. So, as, okay, as Susan uh, mentioned earlier, um, the hatchlings tend to emerge once the temperature drops, once it's cool. Uh, so, even though it's, let's say, uh, midday, if it's overcast or um, it's raining, once the temperature of the sun cools, uh, the hatchlings emerge. Um, so, it it varies depending on the, the ambient temperature um, mm -hmm. at the surface of the sand. So it could be any time of day. Yep, pretty much. I've been out there an entire day, <laughs> pretty much stalking hatchlings on Grand River. Um, you know, just trying to make sure that the, the kobos don't eat them. Um, myself and a couple others have had some interactions with kobos, um, some very... Uh, so an onlooker would look like crazy people trying to talk to the birds to tell them stop eating the hatchlings. Yeah, but, um, you know, when you love something so much, you're willing to be a fool for it, right? So why not? So, um, Jonathan then, also asks about what yeah. other species, what other mm -hmm. predator there is. At yes. night, I have seen the, the opossum, they eat a lot of hatchlings. Yeah. The, the ghost crab, everybody that can take some, even the caimans that is in the river, they come yeah. out and eat a lot of hatchlings. So you have to look out for all these different predators as well. Yeah, yeah. we've, we've seen those in, well, I experienced those in fishing pond already, and it's like, no! <laughs> yeah, how do you deal with that? Is Again, you know, this is where you say um, survival of the fittest, uh, the fittest, mm -hmm. sorry, um, Darwin, um, but I don't necessarily agree with it all the time, but, you know, it is what it is, right? So yeah. um, I think yeah. I think we've reached a stage. I think we've reached a stage uh, in turtle conservation where uh, we can't go too much uh, with the survival of the fittest because we have so much uh, pressure being applied um, naturally mm -hmm. and then by humans that there has mm -hmm. to be some type of intervention to curb the the impact where having yes i i agree with you <laughs> is that 
We try to save as, as many as possible and give them the best chance possible to survive. And, you know, it was just, it was occurring to me this year that, wait a minute, the, the turtles that I helped uh, all those years ago, assuming that they are adults now, they will be coming back now to fish and pond and to run Mantinella to the nest. So it's like, yay. And, I, you know, I would love, love to meet them and just, you know, have that, that kind of interaction with them again after all these years. So, you know, hopefully next year we can get out there and, and do that stuff. So in closing, because I, I know that we've, we've run over the hour and I thank everybody who has joined this conversation here this evening and for the questions, for the comments. Thank you so much for the support over the years. We've spoken to you about how you can get involved as a volunteer, what you do in even to encounter the hatchery. Um, when we go back to the beaches in Tobago, in Trinidad, what can we do? Um, generally, uh, you find turtles. You can find turtles anywhere along the north coast, uh, down the island, the east coast. I've seen them nesting in, in Guaguari Bay. I, I've heard of uh, nesting in Maruga, um, and in Tobago, pretty much uh, all around the island. <laughs> if you're if you're lucky to catch them, um, of course, the yes, the patrols tend to be. Um, Again, dependent, as Susan mentioned, on the resources, the people resources available to do the, the patrols. So we, we've done patrols on Tito Beach Rock and that area, the area we tend to find more people. Um, if we can get more people to, to join on that and learn how, learn the technique um, in terms of things like the torch lights in the area, the area we can prepare, it will really, really help the situation in terms of us managing our resource here in Trinidad and Tobago. So, Suzanne, Kyle, what are some of, where would you like to see sea turtle conservation evolve to? What do you want to see coming out of the, all these decades that you have invested? What would you like to see happen? For me, I would like to see um, the true status of sea turtle in Trinidad in terms of our population. Um, mm -hmm. having a country that really can capitalize on this resource to create sustainable livelihood, um, to be able to understand our population more, to be more educated about um, turtles in general. It must be like when we talk about KFC, people know what leatherback turtle because it's one of our um, main resources. It, it, it's something that is, can really, we can really benefit from. It, it um it can become like uh everybody in Trinidad is the custodians of um this um resource. It's something that the country can move towards protecting, understanding. It's not like a strange icon. It's not like something that is new. But when you talk about turtles, every child, every adult, every citizen of this Republic of Trinidad and Tobago can understand what Leatherback means to our country, why we have them here, what they are about, and what how it benefits the community. So I would like to know that we are placed in the status of the world, the true status of our population, and people can understand that this is a resource that supports community, that change perception, that community people are proud to be the custodians of. We it, create bread and butter it provides schooling everything for our families in our country we are dependent on this resource because we have worked with it it's become our our mantra we love it we we want the whole country to know that we appreciate their support and to continue to support us and to continue to herald the plight of this spectacular and magnificent animal that we have right in our backyard thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you all and we hope that we will continue to create the change that we want to see in respect to turtles in Trinidad and Tobago and in the world as, uh, by extension. Thank you. And Kyle, thank you, Susan. And Kyle, any closing comments? Yeah, I also want to um, thank you for the opportunity of, of sharing some of our knowledge with, with the general public. Um, and having so much interest, you know, uh, persons wanting to participate in the conservation efforts, um, but also to get um, not just the uh, 
the general public in terms of volunteers, but to get the corporate entities as well to get involved and support conservation. Because as Susan mentioned, conservation is an expensive job. Um, especially now with COVID, uh, we aren't able to engage the public through tours. Um, there aren't any resources to build upon existing conservation efforts. Um, so we, yeah. we definitely want to call upon uh, corporate TNT um, to also support conservation of turtles. And a special yeah. thank you uh, to Scotiabank Foundation, who uh, is one of corporate uh, TNT who has started the ball rolling. Uh, so we really want to publicly thank them for, for that. I have one last question. Um, Jonathan asked if uh, if you are aware that uh, Southern Lapwing uh, are no. predators of patch lakes. No, not at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I've yeah. never seen so, Jonathan. I hope that that answers your questions. So, guys, um, for me, what I would like to see, I would like to see continued uh, synergy between groups, um, not only the NGOs, as you mentioned, the corporate. Uh, the governmental. This is our resource, and we have a responsibility to protect it, to do all that we possibly can to protect it. The rest of the world is taking notice. The rest of the world actually wants to pay to come to spend time with our titles. So it's about us recognizing that we have something valuable here, something to promote, whether you want to promote it under responsible tourism, sustainable tourism, ecotourism, tourism on the whole, um, conservation biology, sustainable management, whatever label you want to put it under, it is ours, ours to protect. And guys, I want to, I want to see, yeah, more synergy. I want to see the, see the, um, national sea turtle task force, you know, probably coming out, maybe making some public statements in terms of what they're working on and being accountable to the people of Trinidad and Tobago as to how we are moving forward. You know, um, what are we doing? Are we going to actually move to from three restricted beaches now, which are Grand River, Matura, and Fishing Pond, to more of the coastline, some in Tobago as well? being restricted during turtle nesting season, are we going to, as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, ensure that when we go to the coastline, when we go to even the waterfalls, that we do not leave our garbage there, that even if we see garbage, we carry bags and pick it up and keep a clean scene, <laughs> right? As Charlie used to say, I think it was, right? Um, you know, we have a responsibility to protect these things. This is not about just waiting for the borders to open so people can fly in and see this is ours. And we should get the chance to see these things as well. So Tree Circles Energy is happy to be part of, that, of, of this initiative and to be bringing people together in many different ways. So yes, we can't actually take you all out now to interact with the turtles, but here we are having this conversation virtually to help share information, to get feedback and continue working together because this is our country. This is our planet, um, ours to, to enjoy, ours to protect. Thank you very much to everybody who spent the time with us over the last hour and going on to 20 minutes now. Thank you. Thank you for the interest. And look out for more stuff coming from Three Circles Energy uh, coming up. We have World Chocolate Day coming up in July, so we will be doing something. Suzanne and Kyle, my deepest, deepest gratitude for doing this session, for giving that information, for sharing your time with us, and for all that you continue to do for our country, for our region, and for our Western Hemisphere. <laughs> because of the love of Sea Turtles, thank you so much, guys, and have a safe evening, everybody. Until next time, happy World Sea Turtle Day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.